Hello, hello, hello. I want to talk about denial. I just talked to Paul for a while about the denial that's happening in most humans, in his family, in my family. He talked to me about my mother and he said my, that my mother cared about me and that I misunderstood her, that I did not understand her very well. I know that my mother's and my personality are vastly different and this difference in personality made it so that I could not read her. I could not understand her. And she could not understand me. She probably, she didn't know why I was the way I was. So, he said she cared about me. And he said that the last photos of her that my brother had sent me, the last photos he had sent to me of her, before she died, just like a week or so before. He said that she had a horrified look on her face and that she thinks that she realized in the very end what my brother was up to, that my brother was going to cheat me out of the inheritance, that my brother was murdering her that he was poisoning her and that he was going to poison my, my dad as well. So that makes sense. I That could be very well the case because she kept saying my brother is poisoning her and my brother laid it out as age-related dementia and craziness and on all of that. And my brother laughed it off and now looking back at it, I didn't know what it was. It didn't sound good. It didn't felt didn't f it did not feel right. Okay. It felt scary. And I didn't know what to believe. I didn't even trust my intuition in this. So I thought that's that my mother was in the same mental state that my grandmother was in when my gran grandmother was dying. My grandmother was in in a some in some kind of mental delirium on her last week before she died. And my grandmother was not very old. She was like, what, 70? Something like that, 75 or something. Not very old, actually. She had, she had inflammation in her body and her, she had terrible immune problems. And she was constantly in and out of the hospital. And on the last the, the last week of her life, they had my brother and me come over to say goodbye to her because they knew that she wasn't going to live very much longer. And we sat with her, sat next to her, next to the couch that she was lying down on actually in the dining room of my grandfather's house because that was easier for everyone to take care of her. They couldn't even get her up the stairs anymore. She was constantly in and out of the hospital and she started to talk about stuff that was not in this 3D realm. And my brother and I, I was 13, you know, My brother was eight, and we sat there and and we snickered. You know how teenagers and, and children are. They can be 
very insensitive and they're confused. They're, they don't see the whole picture of it. They don't see that the grandmother is suffering, that she is dying. And what nobody understood at that time was that my grandmother was already seeing another realm that we don't see. We don't see with our normal state of consciousness. We don't see it. We don't see the other energies that are whirling around and entities and draconians and different things that are all part of this the infinite cosmos you know we don't see this stuff that could be standing right next to us ghosts and and so on that stuff that's just not stuff that doesn't make itself visible to us in the 3d but there are entities that can make themselves visible to us in the 3D. But that takes enormous energy for them to do it. They can. So when we are in a mental state, through either through hallucinogenic drugs, which shut down our perception, our there's a formation in the brain. I talked about this many times before. Dr. Hindak Emrich from Germany, where my parents are, he discovered this, actually, this formation called the discrimination rib ribbon. We have a discrimination feature in our brain, in our limbic system in the brain. Perception seems to be running always through this filter, this discrimination ribbon filter. It's a filter. It filters out information. It filters out information that we perceive. So that means every single person, every animal, the animals don't have that discrimination ribbon. And I want to get into this more in detail because that's what I was just talking to Paul about in, in length. The dogs don't have denial. Humans have denial. Okay. Denial has to do with the discrimination ribbon. And the denial can take on more morbid forms also, more intense forms than it's actually intended by the discrimination ribbon. So I don't, I'm not an expert on neurology, but I'm, I'm just talking about this because of the stuff that, that I observe and according to the stuff that I have learned. Uh, about psychology and neurology, not very much. I'm just trying to make sense out of this, what I see and observe and what I have learned and put these puzzle pieces together. We observe, we, we, we perceive things in our environment that our prefrontal cortex would not be able to handle. And because of that, it runs through this filter, this, this discrimination ribbon, as Hinderk Emrich, Emrich called it, Professor Dr. Hinderk Emrich, okay. from Germany. He's no longer alive. He was a good friend of my parents. He was in the Rotary Club. He has contributed a lot to the scientific community. But he himself had a big discrimination ribbon. I talked to him several times. I got my Prozac prescribed from him uh, because they sent me to him because my, my dad knew him. So, but he was not open-minded to primotherapy, was not open-minded to other approaches and other 
perspectives on things. And I love him. I care about him. You know, I respect him. I'm not disrespectful. I'm just saying this is what I observed, you know. And he had an ego too. And and he was probably very critical even of the things that he himself discovered. But what better person than a very, very, very staunch or whatever you call it a staunch scientist that functions in the 3d that is very materialistic for him to discover something like that that is like the going in the other direction the the opposite end of the spectrum right coming across something like that discrimination ribbon my gosh what kind of what kind of questions does that open up what kind of can of worms does this discovery open up when it comes to science and it, when it comes to scientific perspective on things and when it comes to the 3d and when it comes to going beyond the 3D, right? Beyond. There are things beyond the 3D. Like, it's obvious, right? The infinite cosmos is infinite. There are, there's a macrocosmos and there's a microcosmos. Both are infinite, okay? Helena Petrovna Blavatsky talked about it in the 1800s, long before the discovered quarks and neutrinos and she found she saw it she she perceived it she said there are things that are going so far into the microcosmos that that will go into ether that is no longer physical so the physical that you deal with in the 3d is really not physical my spy guard for the haters is made out of carbon it's made out of paper if you zoom in on it or on my hand you you zoom in on it you you go into the microcosmos you go in you look at it through an electron microscope okay that obviously is operated electronically probably but it the reason why they call it electron microscope is because with that you can see the electrons <laughs> in this paper and in my skin and in my hair and in this t-shirt okay or the recliner chair or my artwork you, you zoom in you see the electrons then you zoom in further I don't know how far they can actually zoom in now with latest technology but they zoom in if you zoom in further and further and further you magnify it right further and further and further you go you know first you go past the the little the little mites right that's the first thing you see the little mite then you zoom in on the mite <laughs> You see the might also it's also a physical object you zoom in on the might or you zoom in on my skin cells whatever you zoom in on the might becomes a huge monster first of all you magnify the might right? and you zoom in further and further into it into this microcosmos and you see you start to see electrons and protons you see you see molecules you see an atom the atom of the might of the tardigrade <laughs> monster <laughs> and you or my skin cell or whatever right? and then you you don't see the monster anymore because you've magnified it to such a level that you, you, you can't see the forest for the trees anymore, right? Yeah, the monster has been magnified to such a ma magnificent <laughs> level that you, now you are only zoomed in on 
on the outer surface, on a little speck of the surface of that tardigrade, of that humongous, well, that looks like a caterpillar type of mite, you know, so, and then you zoom in further into that animal, into that insect, right, which is a microscopic insect. So the world is full of those, first of all, you know, we're, we're just surrounded. They're everywhere. They're on our skin, hair. They're, I think that's why we get dandruff, because of those animals. Okay? They eat skin flakes. <laughs> I don't know. And that's why it's important to put diatomaceous earth powder on the scalp, massage that into the dog hair and into your own hair if you have itchy scalp. Okay, so... That will kill those tardigrades and, and the mites. Well, but li that's life. That's that's called flora and fauna. Okay, we're we're surrounded and immersed in all kinds of flora and fauna all the time. Mac macroscopically, microscopically, microscopically. So, but it's okay. You know, we learn to deal with it and all of this. But if you zoom in, if you magnify further and further and further, you can see electrons, protons, atoms. You zoom further into it. You can zoom into the atom or the individual electrons and you come to the point where this, there is no more debate whether something is a particle or a wave. It's both, okay? Depends on which pers pers perspective you look at it. Particle, you know, it starts out with different particles. Of course, you know, you think they are, they are of substance. It's a 3D type of substance, something you can touch, something that's Newtonian physics, you know, something, I mean, they tried to explain this all of this as best as they could. They didn't they didn't have the other knowledge. So they were very stuck because of that. They were stuck and glued to the physical world, right? Uh, there's no blame or, or anything on on Newton. I don't forgot now what Helmut Newton uh, no. <laughs> no. I forgot <laughs> the first name. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a photographer, I think. So, uh, Newton, the the physicist, okay, from 1600, 1700, okay, so obviously that is a long time ago. They didn't have the current knowledge. Now, science cannot ignore the fact that things are going into the ether, okay, that, that things are not physical. After all, okay, you think this is physical here, but it's not physical. It appears physical in this mental state and in this existence moment and in this space and of in this moment of time and even time fades off okay but in this time space continuum spot that we are in here right now okay this is what we perceive but that is not the full reality of it and i'm talking scientific i'm not talking new age or you know New Age goes more into this into the ether, but there there are a lot of misunderstandings in the New Age community. That's always have one tentacle on science, right? I mean, you you don't want to let go of that. You have to stay with science, but that doesn't mean you have to accept science that blocks itself off or scientists that block themselves off from looking further and further and further so we have to look further and further and further if we want to learn more right and we will never learn everything because it's infinite 
See, that's the thing. You will never learn everything because the learning process is an infinite process. And the same with the microcosmos. You're blowing this up right, further. You blow up the tardigrade, you blow up the mites, you blow up your skin cells, you blow up the atom, you blow up the monster. That beautiful tardigrade monster is so gorgeous. Right? And then you blow everything up further and further and further, and that even the skin flag of the tardigrade, and you go further and further and further into that microcosmos by keep on keeping on blowing it up further and further and further, and you see that things are not physical. Okay, you see that there is ether. Okay, there is there is intermolecular space. There is inter subatomic space, and that the subatomic particles itself can go the 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 breakdown into further and further waves, then it becomes waves, it becomes energy, okay, and then we have the ether. This is a world of ether that is not physical. Okay. And our bodies can perceive a lot from that, okay, from the non physical, so, so to speak. We can perceive a lot. That's why telepathy is for real, okay, because we perceive things, and the people that are more attuned, tuned into that radio frequency. They will perceive it. They, the people that are fine-tuned to it, very highly sensitive people that are fine-tuned to it, that are not on alcohol or any of these things, huh? that are not eating meat, that are very, very perceptive. You know, that boy, Kaspar Hauser, he, he was, he grew up in a dark catacomb because because the person who was supposed to kill him couldn't kill him. He just couldn't do it. He felt sorry for him. So he put him in the catacomb and then lied to the people who told him to kill him that he killed him, but he didn't. So he, that was a story in Germany. Long story. I don't want to... That, that's a long, long-ass story. I, I'm going to just sway way out. But Kaspar Hauser, you know... He was the heir to the to a throne, and because the the person that was that wanted her children, her boys, to become the in, the the heirs to the throne, she killed everyone from from the so-called first lineage that was were supposed to take on the throne to become. The kings and the, and the rulers of this that particular region, and that was in in the 1700s. Oh wait a minute, was it? Oh, I'm confused now. No, that was in the early 1800s. That was around 1812. So there was it was still going on. The rulers and all of the, they didn't have a parliament and all of. So there was the, there was still like kingdoms and stuff. So, and that that lady who married into that lineage, she wanted her sons to take on the throne. So she killed all the ones from Stephanie de Beauvarnay, who was who was the the right first degree lineage. Her children because she was married to that prince, to that king, and their ch her, her children with him were supposed to take on the throne. They didn't have birth control, and they were constantly giving birth, of course, and then mysteriously all the boys from that right lineage, they didn't make it. They died, or and they they made it out to look like illness, or, or, or stillbirth and so, stuff like that. And they didn't do investigations. They didn't even know how to investigate any of that. But it was pretty obvious, like, 
all the boys, not the girls, you know, the boys were the, 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 the ones that take on the throne. So, so they were afraid of those. And Caspar was one of those. And that wasn't even his original name that Stephanie de Beauvernet gave him. So his original name was prob probably something like Hubertus de Beauvernet or something, or, or I forgot now what the, the actual name was. But the person who was supposed to kill him, he gave him the name Kaspar Hauser. And he thought, you know, Kaspar unlearned everything that he had ever learned in his, in his short stay with Stephanie de Beauvernet. Actually, oh gosh, it is such a complicated uh, story. It is so complicated and so bizarre. He, the person who was supposed to kill him, Put his own baby that was born into the into the crib of instead of Kaspar Hauser, okay. And his own baby, actually his own baby that actually had died. His own baby that was born at the same time as Kaspar had died because of illness. They constantly had illness. The, the kids were constantly dying. They, they didn't have any vaccine. So he put his own dead baby boy into the crib, and then they all thought that was, that was Stephanie's baby, and they thought Stephanie's baby died. And so he took the other one, and he was told to, to do that, and he was told to kill that, the real one. And he couldn't do it. He instead raised them as his own child, but only for a few, for two years or so. And Stephanie de Beauvernet really loved that child. She didn't even know why, because that was a real child. And he would bring her, him to her because he felt sorry, you know, so, but he couldn't tell anyone because then he would be killed and his whole family would be killed. I mean, they had a mafia like Islam and it, it just was different religion, but it was the same thing. It was, it was a fear-based society, you know. So every time Caspar was with Stephanie de Beauvernet, his real mother, they would they would bond just like that. I mean, they were they felt it energetically, but nobody could really tell how, why, or how. But see, that's the subatomic energy that we feel and perceive. But at some point, he started to look like more and more and more like Stephanie de Beauvernet and also the the, the father. So he got scared for the child, and he took the child. And then he told the other people his child got lost or someone stole his child. And instead he brought the child, he put the child into, into the catacombs of that very castle. And then the child didn't get to see anyone. It was extremely cruel, okay, extremely cruel. But the, the, the guy didn't know. He thought that was better than, than death. And... I don't know if it is, you know, I really don't think so. Maybe for this child, I don't know. It's, that child was unbelievably resilient. But most children would not survive this, to be put into a catacomb you know, with a little wooden play horse. You know. and that's the only thing that he learned to say is, is ross, which means horse. That's an old-fashioned way of, of saying horse. Was 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 how they called horse, and he could only say was and and I don't know one or two other words, and that was also right around the time when he started to learn, and you know that's when they learn to speak and talk, and so that definitely did a lot to him. So with that, that caused all kinds of problems with learning language. 
but he was already i think most of the, most for most part was already past that he was already had already started to learn to talk but then nobody talked anymore to him and then he unlearned certain words so i think maybe it was not didn't impair his speech because once he was rescued when he was 16 or 17 years old but before so it's a long story and I didn't want to get into it but it is so so unbelievably amazing that story so he had to remove him from the catacombs of that castle because he was afraid that the, the people that are there working for that that queen that married into that lineage that wanted her only her sons to survive that she would find out that he kept him alive in the catacombs so he brought him to he brought him like a whole day of carriage drive you know they used horseback and carriage whole day of carriage drive he brought him to another castle and introduced him as his mm -hmm. child and then he put him into their catacomb and I guess he I don't know if he stayed there with him or if he handed him over to someone else to take care of him in the catacomb I don't know yeah, those are all obscured all of these things but he may have stayed there with them and who knows you know. but I think the the queen that the bad queen that married into it I think she started to get suspicious of this activity and was starting to ha send people in to investigate on undercover her for her only you know and and so then he finally, because he felt sorry for him, they felt, or whoever that was that took care of him, then they f they they couldn't ha ha have him in there anymore. In that ca in that castle it was too dangerous for them, and they felt sorry for the boy. So one day, at when he was like sixteen or seventeen, whoever was taking care of him, giving him bread and water, he took him out of there. And he brought him to Nuremberg, Nuremberg, in Germany, and that was not that far from there. Also, I don't know, farther south or somewhere. And they, he, and he just dropped him off there at the marketplace, just by himself. That boy that did not to talk, and he gave him a letter that that was supposedly written by his father, which was not. And the letter just to mislead, to lead people astray, so that the bad woman didn't find out who he is. But it was obvious that it would, the word would get around very, very quickly, because that was an unheard of situation that hadn't happened before. There was suddenly a teenager who couldn't talk. And everyone started talking about it. The newspaper started writing about it. They, it. The word got around to different places. And then, of course, the bad lady further north, she found out about this. And then she started to send out bad people that were supposed to kill him. And, yeah, so he only knew his name was Kaspar Hauser and that his father was was a horseman and that that he had written this letter for him and that that's all he was to told to say and, and then hand people this letter from the father please take care of my son um, and we couldn't take care of him because i don't know for what what whatever reason and so kasper hauser when he was first released out of that catacomb his sensory perception was extremely high because there was almost no light source. You know, when it was daylight, there was on, only like a tiny little sunbeam coming out out of the, the cracks of the walls. 
and that would shine into the dust on the, on the floor of that catacomb. And so when he first was exposed to sunlight, he could not open his eyes. He, it was too much for him. It was too bright, the sunlight. He called it gastic, which means nasty, you know, like nasty sunlight, gastic, ah, oh, yeah, like sunbeams. And then gradually got used to it. He also never ate meat, so when he first tasted meat, he was like, ugh, that's horrible, this is terrible. He's, he actually had a nervous breakdown when he first tasted it. It's, that's like eating a corpse, you know, like horrible thing, you know. Then gradually, very gradually, he got used to that because they kept on forcing it on him, you know. And when he was, before he started eating meat, he had a real, real attuned and special relationship to the animals. So every animal in the, in, in the house of that teacher that took him in. So as soon as he started to eat meat, he, he was no longer that attuned to the animals. Some animals that came in that actually started to growl at him. But before he ate meat, no animal ever growled at him. Even wild animals liked him. So, so it goes to show the level of attunement, you know, when we, when we don't eat meat or processed food, you know, we're way more attuned. We're way more in our natural mental state. And we perceive things much better, you know. Also, if you, if you grow up without sunlight, your retina is way more sensitive to anything, okay? And I'm sure he was also very attuned to the ether as well. So I'm very sure of that. So most people are not attuned. Some people are more attuned. That's also genetic, of course. And Kasparov was genetically already more attuned. So then with that situation was even more attuned. But then he showed us the difference between veganism and meat. Okay, what that does, what just in the same person, what that does, how that numbs the brain down, how that numbs your perception and your intuition and your also your fine-tuning perception in in your your limbic system in and in your ether perception and in the discrimination ribbon okay so obviously this the discrimination ribbon is also gets strengthened i don't know if that's true but it probably gets it gets thickened through desensitization and meat and all kinds of stuff, right? Like where people, are, they, they lose their natural psychic abilities through that. So I'm just guessing now, I don't know for sure. But when someone gets very sick, certain sicknesses, like inflammation, fever particularly, fever. I have my own story. I talked about this before in my videos. In previous videos, I've talked about it, how I saw a draconian <laughs> at age 11. Nobody's going to believe this. Nobody, almost nobody will believe that. I saw the draconian just like I see Paul sitting there in the chair. Because I was in a fever delirium. I had high fever, I had salmonella infection. We were in Kenya on a vacation in a hotel. And the day before we went to into Mombasa, Kenya, because my brother had a, a tooth infection that had to be treated. And on the way back to the, ho to the hotel, we stopped at a 
restaurant, which was a big mistake. They should have just bought bottled water that had a cap on it, a sealed cap. But we went naive, as my parents always were, went into this restaurant. They gave me a glass of water. The cup, the glass of water was contaminated with salmonella. They, they, they were not clean. They didn't wash the dishes very well. I was the only one who got infected by the salmonella. And that very night, I didn't feel good. I went to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night from a horrendous dream. I was in space with only a phone. And I wanted to call my mother, but there is no contact. I can't. My mother is too far away from me. And that's very symbolic to this personality difference between my mother and me. We didn't have the same frequency to talk to each other on. I thought she didn't care. But Paul convinced me now that she did care about me. But she didn't know how to convey it to me. Because, and I couldn't read it, because she was sometimes very sarcastic and mean. And she, and I went on her nerves, and I think she was jealous of me. That all stood in the way between us. You know. That all stood so horribly in the way, but she wasn't consciously aware of all of this. If she had been consciously aware that she was actually jealous, she would have probably gone into therapy and done everything she could in order to to bring back harmony between her and me. Okay. But she was not aware and she was in a deep state of denial also. So this discrimination ribbon has a lot to do with denial also. I think it does. So, but then when people are getting into age-related dementia mm -hmm. or into a fever delirium, delirium or they, they are on hallucinogenic drugs, mm -hmm. then that weakens that filter in the limbic system. Mm -hmm. That weakens the discrimination ribbon. Mm -hmm. He called it ribbon, but it's really like a, a it's an intricate network. It's almost like a spider web or something. It is like a coffee filter, you know, that that our perception goes through. And the stuff from the ether gets caught in that coffee filter that does not get routed up into our prefrontal cortex, into our conscious, aware, awake consciousness. Okay. So it gets filtered out. So only the, the stuff from the 3D gets routed in because that's the stuff we deal with on a daily basis. I think navigation through life could become a problem. If we didn't have that filter, we would probably see things, ghosts around us that we would make a circle around, thinking it's in the 3D. And we might bump into something else because of that. Or we see things in the 3D and we see through the stuff. Because that table there is also in the ether. The, the table is not solid. And then I see the table or maybe I see another entity in the table or that entity runs away, I walk past that entity and then get caught by the table and fall over. So there's a reason why we have the discrimination ribbon, so that we can deal with this 3D real. Okay. We will run right through a ghost all the time. Okay. Or another entity. And sometimes we feel like, oh, that felt kind of weird. Is there a draft? Or this feels strange, but we can't put our head, wrap our head around it. Most people don't even perceive anything. 
I saw the draconian hanging over the toilet with a smile on, on his face. It felt like a teenage boy draconian. And he was looking at me like he was laughing about me. Like, <laughs> you are going to be hanging over this toilet in no time. Here's the toilet for you. You know, this kind of like in this, he is in a different mental state, in a different energetic realm. Okay. And that's what I think draconians are. They are in a. In, the diff in a different energetic realm. They are constantly in the realm of, like, I want to word myself correctly. They are in the realm of, I must be dominating over you or you, you will dominate over me. So I have no other choice than other than to dominate over you. They're in that kind of realm. They're in the mega dualistic realm. Okay. More even than humans. And that's why David Icke talks about this. They are, that's why he talks about the reptiles. Those are draconians. Okay. And that people can shape shift into those. That sounds very, very mega bizarre, but I am not going to laugh about David Icke anymore. I never did, but I thought it was what he said was came from overdoing ayahuasca, okay, so, which he did. <laughs> but I'm not going to dismiss this anymore as BS because he did ayahuasca. I mean, the ayahuasca just opened him, his brain wide up. Okay. Wide, wide, wide up. More than my brain. So, but that has plus and minus, always. You know. So, I think because of that, that makes him suffer a lot. So, it makes him actually want to numb that down. It's too much. That's why he drinks beer. That's why he looks like he's nine months pregnant. I'm not laughing about him. I'm just observing this. He has to numb himself somehow or he would be not be in 24 hours seeing every single thing around him. Okay. It's too much. You can't do that. I'm also... I'm, my brain is bombarded too much. I don't see the draconians all the time. I only, only while I had the fever delirium. Del I never forgot it, but I have, I thought, I think it was around that time when I started to read my dad's parapsychology books. When we got back home, I think that's unconsciously also. I didn't even know why I saw the parapsychology books over his bed, the entire library over his bed, of shelves, bookshelves behind his bed, all the way to the ceiling, all parapsychology. So I thought I was just drawn to it. And I read those books, started reading those books. And I believed it. And when I was 13, I told people I wanted to study parapsychology. So I didn't, I didn't understand that we didn't have that subject field yet. People were too Newtonian to allow something like this. But well, I'm getting into it now, so it's never too late, you know. And I've always been interested in I've always been drawn to it and reached for it so and tried to make sense of out of stuff that that I heard about from other people I always believed those ghost stories but it's a very convenient way of the the greed community the greed based community to gaslight people and say, Oh, you are you're crazy, you know, you're just 
you're Pollyanna, you just, you think you're seeing stuff, you think you're, you're psychic, or you think these things, you, you're too gullible, you believe everything, that's a, that's gaslighting, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to dismiss anything anymore that I hear, I mean, some things are very, they seem very, 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 very crazy, and very hyped up, okay, but, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dismiss things anymore that I hear from other people, obviously, this is, there is so much stuff going on, you have no freaking idea, and Paul doesn't want to know about it, he's, I think Paul is afraid, he doesn't want to, you know, when we first bought this house, there were ghosts in here, not just one, but I think two. I mean, this house is not that old. It was built in 1983, but shit happened here, and I'm sure of it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be murder. It can be psychoterror. It can be also gaslighting and making people crazy with gaslighting. Gaslighting is what makes people crazy, not the other way around. Okay, so... Not like the gaslighter detects your craziness and then tells you about it. So first of all, it's not, not the nicest thing to do in the first place, right? To tell someone you are just bad shit nuts. No, it's not a nice thing to do because it's a very arrogant and very ignorant thing to do. So, no, it's a, it's a method of making someone crazy. It's a method of making your child crazy. Oh, you, you crazy nutcase. My neighbors talk like this to their dogs. It's heartbreaking, you know. I feel like taking the dogs away from them. Don't ever say to your dog, you, are you you crazy or retarded or something or or are you insane or something oh now i just realized i said even said it to him but i didn't say it in a mean way i just said it in like you are going rambunctious and you're hurting me and you're scratching me and in, in that way but you don't say that to your dog just because your dog isn't minding or something don't call your dog retarded or completely batshit crazy or something. Just like that. And I have to watch what, what I say. I have to watch my words. I don't want to say that again. It's a knee-jerk reaction. Like he's jumping on me with claws because he is hyped up and he's bored and he wants action. Well, he doesn't know he's hurting me, and then it's hurting, and I'm like, what's the matter with you, crazy? What is going on? Yeah. So, you are, an, are you insane? <laughs> but I don't say it in a mean way. I just say, I just say it in a startled way, sort of. But I still shouldn't say that. Still, still should not say it. I should say... I should say, baby, you're hurting me. Don't do it. No. So that would be better. Words carry an energy, so no. No, he's not insane. He's he's just full of joy and, and he's a young he's a youngster and he has is full of energy and he needs exercise and I'm not giving him the exercise, so Now I realize that my mother cared about me. I thought she didn't. <sighs> because our personalities clashed and we the personalities are so vastly different that I couldn't read her. I misinterpreted her, she misinterpreted me. That's why I always said to her, I love you infinitely much so that she understands. But how does she understand that? 
when she, you know, I'm go going overboard, I, I send her presents. I say I love you infinitely much. You know, I, I care about you. And, and then the next conversation we have about animal rights, I go insane on her. And, and I go, why would you buy this product, Lancaster? Tested on animals, you know. And then you buy it again after I told you. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's awful. And I go completely berserk on her. And then she goes in her head, I wonder if she means it when she says, I love you infinitely much. You know? Sometimes she said to me that she thinks I'm cold and harsh with people. And I go, huh? that doesn't make sense. I'm the opposite of that. But then, you know, I have to introspect. I can get, I can become a battle axe. I can become a war monster when I, when I, you know, I see things from one, only from one perspective. I see only animal rights perspective. I don't see my mother in that moment. I can only see she and her sister, they bought Lancaster products, anti-wrinkle creams in Berlin, right? In a, in a high-end perfume store and spent I don't know like 300 freaking macaronis on it on something that tested on animals after I told her not to after I told her that Lancaster I even sent her a petition that Lancaster tests on animals well she did it did it anyway because she's not attuned right but then I wasn't attuned to her Okay. And I become the battle axe against her. Then she thinks I don't love her. Okay, And this went on throughout my entire freaking life, this thing. I am mother hen. I am mega duper ultra battle axe protective dog mother, animal mother in general. And I see things through that, through these glasses. I don't see the other. I don't see the hunter with his pain and problems. I don't see the woman who's buying wrinkle cream from Lancaster. I don't see her or, or my aunt at that moment. I can't see that she is not in the right, she's not attuned, she's not, Paul will also say they don't care. And that's what I think in that moment too. You know. But she does; she's not attuned in that moment. She's the hunter is not attuned. The meat eater, oh, that's what I eat every day. Like his dad, for example, meals on wheels every stinking day. He gets his meat, we food delivered to him. Meals on Wheels in L.A. Yeah? And he eats it mindlessly. He's not attuned. If I come in and get real mad at 80-year-old Ernie right, and say, you murderer, you eat meat, he's like, hmm? That lady is crazy, angry, mad. She's a mad hatter. She's... She hates me for no reason, right? That's what will go through his mind. Because neither one of us are attuned. We're not on the same frequency here. We're not talking to each other on the same radio frequency. I talk through radio frequency, mother hen, overly, over crazy animal protection. Okay? That's my frequency. But most people are not on that frequency. Okay. A chimpanzee is not going to be on that frequency. Okay. If I go to a chimpanzee and I say with sign language, you know, some of them learn sign language, I say, you, I don't know sign language, but you jerk, you know. The chimpanzee doesn't understand why I would say that to him. 
he just thinks I'm an asshole. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> I say, you jerk for eating an animal. Huh? I'll, I'll say, you need to a head cut off or something. And the, and the chimpanzee will cut my head off for that. So, huh. uh, the, the Muslim doesn't trail far behind from the chimpanzee. Right? So it's the same, exact same thing, really, the same, the same principle. Right? The Muslim grows up with a shit religion, doesn't know anything else. Right? He, the Muslim is told, you, you can rape little girls, and he thinks that. That's good. Like Ernie eats meal meals on wheels, you know, the the dead dead pig corp on it. Not attuned, right? Not not tuned into it. Two different radio frequencies, obviously, happening here. I mean, if an animal rights activist goes into a meat restaurant. And start screaming at people, eating peacefully, eating their, eating their meat, meat dinner, their corpse dinner. Right? Animal rights activist goes in there, starts screaming at everyone. I mean, do you blame the bodyguard or the bouncer for coming in and like gently, politely bouncing that animal rights activist? Out of that restaurant? Do you blame him for that? I mean, <laughs> we're like, they're talking on two different frequencies. One talks on frequency animal rights, and the other one talks on frequency bouncer, and the other ones are like completely confused. They're talking on frequency religious brainwashed whatever you know not attuned they think animals don't have brains but <laughs> that's why why don't we instead of war why don't we create a situation where we at least try to at least try to educate each other of each other's radio frequency. So Paul is filling up the water bottles with the, through a filter. I can't drink we can't drink the water that comes out of the pipes because the pipes, I don't know what they did, they, they used copper, that's why the water comes out blue, so I'm not, we shouldn't eat too much copper, some copper is good but not too much, so we have to filter it. We have to filter it through the, the filter of filtering out copper and metals, not through the filter of any other filter, Islam or religion or Christian or whatever. This is a good filter that they are using. That's not the discrimination ribbon filter that he uses to filter the water out from the pipes. <laughs> but um, our discrimination ribbon filter has a lot to do with religion, has a lot to do with religiousness. It has a lot to do with herd mentality denial deep denial has a lot to do with herd mentality okay a lot just be before i turn the video off i have been wanting to talk about this one story that i saw i saw a documentary film about i saw a documentary film a long time ago about People that had, that was, we still had a TV at that time, was on TV. It was a TV sh show called I Shouldn't Be I Shouldn't Be Alive or something. A TV show like this where people made it made it through alive through through unimaginable 
horrible situations. <laughs> and it's a strange light coming in right now. <laughs> Amazing light. I see all of that. <laughs> it's the sun coming from an angle. It's beautiful. So, yeah, and in that, in that, that situation that the that people reported, two people survived that. That's a horrendous situation that they survived. A situation where they they had the lady had a yacht in the Atlantic Ocean. They were somewhere from Maine or something way out there on the east coast and they had she had this yacht and she called the yacht trash man big mistake right there and there now you don't want to call anything trash or trash man because it carries with it an energy an energetic vibration even a boat shouldn't be called that because here's what happens because she called that yacht trash man because she had a a waste disposal corporation that she was running made a lot of money had money to get yacht to call the yacht trash man was not a good idea so anyway she and her friends they went on board of that trash man the yacht and they went out way out into the atlantic ocean miles and miles I don't know, 100 miles out there into into the ocean. And what happened was something leaked. There was a leak in the boat that they didn't know. So the water started to get in very gradually. They started to panic. The, the, the lower level of the yard started to fill up with water. They called for help. It was already nighttime when that when the when the water started to fill up. They were all drinking alcohol. They weren't really paying attention. Was they were kind of partying. I don't know how many people that there were. Only five people. Or so. They were celebrating something. And now now now, I want to explain to you why you shouldn't call your boat trash man, because they started. They called for the boat rescue you know the the coast guard boat rescue and they called him many 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 times and they said trash man here please help us so <laughs> there are two scenarios that can ha happen a the, the the dispatch thought they were just joking around right they were trolls or something or the dish dispatch thought, oh, they, they, their, their boat is called Trash Man. That, that way, uh, they're probably not very serious, or they're, they could be joking, or they're not, or they're just trash. Right? I mean, that, that that's kind of thing that can happen in people's brains. Right? People like that shouldn't be working as dispatch. People who work at, at the dispatch for emergency should always ask and ask and ask and ask and ask and ask. Where are you? What's is that the name of your boat? Who? What's your names? Where are you located? What What is your coordinate spot that you are in right now in the Atlantic Ocean? And how can I get, get to you? And and what's happening to the ship can you get the, the emergency inflatable boat out and keep them on the line right but the dispatch didn't do it they had to call the dispatch several maybe the dispatch was drunk and then when they said trash man here the dispatch was probably laughing maybe because the dispatch was drunk there are different si situations but this is what can actually unfold when you call your ship trash man this can happen because, and that's why I say you don't think it carries an energy because you're too much in your three-dimensionality. But this is what can happen out of it. This is the result of these kind of scenarios can unfold in the 3D 
out of a vibration of the wrong name. Yeah, okay. That, I hope I made this very crystal clear. So what happened then is the dispatch does, just did not do anything. They didn't do anything. They didn't send any help, nothing. Okay, the, wa the boat filled up with water more and more and more. They got the emergency boat. Finally, they jumped into it. Then something happens there. Something, a first aid kit or some kind of extra emergency radio that had all of that was in some kind of package that when the boat slightly tipped over that thing fell overboard and and got washed away very quickly so they were the the actual yacht sank under the water they were only in that inflatable boat hundreds of miles out into the atlantic and they had nothing there okay they were in that boat for a week now here's this is horror film material the classic horror film material so here's what another thing that's happened that ties right into denial. One of the guys on board was three people. Two guys and one woman could not handle that situation at all. T two guys that were on that boat, they could not handle being without water at all. So they had some kind of bottle or something that they brought with them, alcohol bottle, right? That they brought with them. That was the only thing they rescued, right? So once that was downed, the next day they, they didn't have anything to drink. The alcohol was no longer in the body. They pissed that all out. So then they started to get sober, the, the reality of the situation started to sink in. <laughs> and then they were, they didn't know how to deal with it at, at, at all. They were like, what are we going to do? And they started yelling at each other, blaming each other, right? And then two guys, the two guys that had saved their bottle, <laughs> they started to scoop up salt water with their bottles. And they started to drink salt water. Bad idea because salt the salt water cannot be that cannot be filtered out of the body very well. Okay, so it goes into the kidneys, ruins the kidneys. That's the first thing the kidneys start to shut down. Then they start to get toxic, they started to get crazy also from that. But now that's not because of only because of that craziness, but also the denial. At some point, one of the guys takes scoops of salt water, gets up and says, cheers. I don't recall exactly in detail, but, but that's what I remember. He, he says, cheers to everyone. And he says, I'm just going to go home. <laughs> And he steps off the boat as he would walk. Then he walk on water, but pretty soon he's going under the water with his bottle. And sharks have already been around the boat because one of the ladies had injured herself. And she was slightly bleeding, so they, they had a bunch of sharks around the boat, circling. But then they were somehow able to get that lady that was bleeding into the boat with all her force, all their force. And that lady was starting to get like a toxic shock because they were sitting in a cesspool. They were all pissing and shitting <coughs> into the boat that was also full of water and, and urine. And she had an open wound. So she was getting started to get toxic shock on her system, which caused her also to, be, to become crazy. But she was not the first to go. The first to go was the guy said, I'm going home. <laughs> and he got eaten by the sharks. And they, they saw, watched the whole thing there, right next to them, as the sharks were tearing him up and all of that. 
And the, the, the next one to go was the other guy that was drinking salt water. He also started to get, the next day or so, he started to get up and said, this is all bullshit. I'm going to go to the, to the liquor store now. <laughs> I mean, that's like, no, that's deep, deep, deep sea denial. <laughs> Literally, right? That's deep sea denial going on in the brain. That's like, that's the denial of a wounded deer. Okay, that's that's material for <coughs> Vilana Yana Ramachandran at UC San Diego, neurologist. He gets up, he says, I'm going to the liquor store. You ha have a nice evening. <laughs> he, he walks out, also walking on the water, drowns, sharks eat him. Bye bye. You know. Now there are three people on the boat, one man and two women. The one woman is injured and getting toxic shock. And so at day four or something, or five, that woman with the toxic shock is so sick she's dying. And she knows that and she starts to do hand movement like she was she like she wants to curse the other two people. Like she's blaming them for the situation. And the woman that that the one woman that stayed sober and the other guy that they, they that did nothing they just accepted the situation and did nothing the two people they just looked at her and and they said we're all literally here in the same boat nobody is to blame okay and then the lady with the toxic shark died and then the guy said should we eat part of her meat and the lady said forget it that, that would just kill us right away. So they pushed her body overboard. So now there were only two people left on that inflatable boat. And they waited for their death. Okay. Without water, without food. Bright, harsh sunlight every day on them. At night, total darkness. <coughs> Sharks around the boat toxic soup that they were sitting in and so I think it was the sixth or seventh day when they were just hanging on by a threat they were almost gonna die when a large freight ship was passing by and large freight ship was coming passing by and and someone on that freight ship saw this inflatable boat and these two people that were just hanging there barely alive and they alerted them and the freight ship stopped and they came over with a rescue boat they rescued these two people they brought them on board and the two survivors they barely reached to each other's hands as they were lying there on the deck of that freight ship and there they were given water and medical attention and everything and they made it through the woman became a motivational speaker and they dated for a while they were because they'd been through so much together okay so i don't know what happened what came about the guy but this, these two people made it through this because they did nothing. They just accepted that situation. They didn't do anything. They, did, they didn't go crazy. They didn't go into denial. They didn't drink salt water. They didn't push anyone overboard. They didn't try to struggle with anything. They also didn't try to help someone who, someone else who was I think, I don't know, I don't remember exactly, but they could not, they didn't have the strength to help each other. So they, one of them, I think it was, I think it was the woman that at some point when they were just the two of them, she almost fell over the overboard, but the guy didn't have the strength to help her back in, but, but she gathered up the last strength she had to come back into the boat. So... 
unbelievable situation. Unbelievable. But with a lot of willpower, staying calm, not going into denial, you know, that saved their lives. But if the freight ship had not seen them, they would not have made it. As a lot of people haven't. A lot of people. So I just wanted to add this story at the end because I wanted to explain what denial can cause. It can cause a mental state where a person goes into, and that's the, the, that's the physical form of denial, that uh, Vilayana Ramachandran calls, calls anosognosia. It is, it is a physical state of denial where the person will not accept the reality of an illness or an incapa incapacitated limb or a specific situation that is a dead end street or a drug addict, for example, will go into anosognosia thinking that because it feels too horrible to be off the drugs mm -hmm. so that they will actually start thinking that the drug use is what they need and they, they make themselves think that it's okay when, it, when it's a slow suicide, when it's a bus coming towards them but they're in anosognosia and that's why, what I think is, my, is what's happening with my brother right now my brother is like these two people that scooped up salt water and drank it. He is a mind like that. He's genetically like that. And he is now full force drug addict and he cannot live without the drugs. And because of that, he goes into a state of anosognosia. And out of that, he's not originally a totally violent person, but because of that, he becomes a criminal now, and he is will will do anything to get the drugs, even murder people. So that's where my brother is at right now. My brother needs to be taken immediately into in into a drug rehab, insane asylum, into a, a therapy help center that's closed right now, immediately. Okay, to save him and others from harm. That's what needs to happen right now. Okay. That's, it is tragic, it is horrific. It's absolute horror that's playing out there at my, my father's house. And that's why I, I have taken a lawyer and that's why I pray to the blue God that we make this, make it through this. I hope, I pray to the blue God that we are saving my father from being poisoned, from going through the same destiny that my mother went through. Okay, that's all I can say now because I am, I am not afraid of saying things mm -hmm. that sound like I am a traitor to my family or whatever people believe. You know, there are religious people out there that were if someone is like this one girl said talk, talked about her jehovah's witness parents mm -hmm. she and her sister were repeatedly raped by her father the jehovah's witness community did not believe the girls mm -hmm. because the father was a preacher there in the jehovah's witness cult and people will actually go into into a deep denial to believe the preacher because it feels better than to believe the girls. Mm -hmm. One of the girls said, I absolutely had it mm -hmm. with all of you. Mm -hmm. One of the girls broke out of the Jehovah's Witness cult. Even though she mm -hmm. was brought up in it, she was indoctrinated from day one in it. Mm -hmm. But she's a big soul, mm -hmm. and she's a more advanced soul, and she saw, she sees, with a, she's not in denial about it. And there was only one way to deal with this, to get the heck out of that cult. Okay, and she did. And her boyfriend too, they both come from there. Amazing people, amazing, amazing, amazing. But apparently, you know, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of courage for people to 
want to see reality, you know. So, but I think a lot of people in the world, they, I think this is more physical than we think. It is more anosognosia than it is a deliberate denial in most humans. That's what I think. So I'm ending the video with this here now. And I just want to, I, I, I appreciate all of you. I appreciate, I love all, I care about all. Okay, when I go in the chat room, I, I always come with good intentions. I get mad sometimes, but I care about everyone. And I don't know who these people are who are abusing me. Some people are nice in the chat room. I don't know if those are the same people. But, you know, I care about the nice people. I appreciate the nice people. I just want you to know this. And I care about all people and all beings. Okay, so peace and love. Take care.